I just want to talk a little bit about kind of data capital. Um, this is a slightly kind of accounting sort of economist view of data. I apologize, having, having just listened to a very wonderful presentation about the humane element of data and big data, and, uh, and this may feel a bit contradictory, but um, let me just take you through it, and also about how Guernsey and the Isle of Man, and perhaps Jersey, but perhaps not, um, can have a role in an offshore data center, um, and how it can look after the capital. Why is data, data is suitable for offshore environments really because of, um, we like to call it in the Isle of Man top trumps. I don't know if anyone remembers top trumps. On top trumps, you may not win every time you hand a card, but you're overall, you're gonna win by the combination of some areas where you're very good and some areas where you're not so good. And, and so we look at a, a data uh, really around a, a, top, a top trump way of looking at it. And that's because Dare I say it, there will always be places that do better technology than us. There may well be places that do better um, uh, legal and regulatory than us. There may be better places to do, um, to do uh, data centers. You know, if it can get pretty hot, then actually they sure as hell use a lot of, a lot of electricity. Um, so there are a whole different uh, myriad of, of, uh, of, of, of categories that are good for us. But... We're good at confidentiality and sensitivity. We've done it before with financial data. We can do it with other, other data. Um, we are politically and geophysically strong and stable and have been for ages. Um, certainly in the Isle of Man, when I've got uh, clients that are e-gamers and they've got businesses in, and data centers in the Philippines, there's always a nervous twitch when there's a typhoon about to hit the, the South Pacific. So we find ourselves in a much more uh, politically stable environment which helps us and we have strong international co communication as well as telecommunication and an also sort of human communication so we're not the only people looking at this and you will look to Europe and you will see Switzerland going for data and you will look to Luxembourg and they are going for data uh, propositions too so the question is is whether or not Guernsey can and the Isle of Man and Jersey to a lesser extent speed up and be, take some first mover advantage. I don't know whether or not people will think about data collection and big data being new, but actually I challenge you that this is not new. There was a, a, a neighbor of ours uh, here, close, just a little bit south, by the name of William the Conqueror. He was probably one of the first people to do a big data exercise, and it ended up being called the Doomsday Book. So it's been around for a long time. It's just that we're now digitizing it where previously it was written in paper. So we're really, I see data as the, and other people have read about it, it is the new asset class. And the World Economic Forum back in 2011 actually identified it as a new asset class. And it, was, it set up a whole think tank about how to look at personal data and what to do with it. And what was interesting was one of the conclusions from that World Economic Forum was the fact that data could be held in a personal data account. Now, I'm sure there are people sitting in the audience who realize that Guernsey, Jersey, Isle of Man, offshore financial centers, they kind of look after personal accounts a lot. Uh, we've got pounds in them, we've got assets in them, they may be real estate, they may be alternative funds, they may be currencies, but we look after people's accounts. Why can't we turn that into a data account and actually manage data accounts and look after them? So what is it about data capital? What is it that makes it slightly different, um, different from a stack of paper? Well, I think we should be looking at it like we look after financial capital and human capital in businesses, because it is a new asset class. Enterprises really need to pay special attention to it, because it's the source of much of the added value that we've been hearing about all morning um, from John and from Jay about how they've taken data and they've turned it into and monetized it in a strong way. But it's non-rivalrous. By that, what do I mean? Well, if you think about physical capital, like a car or a truck, it's on its own. It's one. You can only, only one person can take hold of the truck and only one person can use it. Data's not like that. I can have it. John can have it. Emma can have it. Nick can have it. And it's all the same pieces of data. So it gets copied multiple times. So it can be used by more than one person. We can throw it through many different algorithms, as, we, as we've heard Emma talk about. And that adds to the confusion about who owns it and whether or not um, 
I think somebody was talking earlier on about autonomous cars. Does the car maker own the data that the autonomous car collects? Does it the, is it the person who's supplied the sensors that owns the data? Is it the passenger that owns the data because they're in it? So I think there are lots of questions about whether or not it's you know, whose data it is. It's non-fungible, that's a bit of an accounting term. Most other commodities in the world are fungible. A barrel of oil looks exactly the same as the next barrel of oil. A bar of gold, apart from the identity code, looks exactly the same as the next bar of gold. Data's not like that. One piece of data, if you take it at its minimum point, is actually very unique, and every other piece of data will look different to that. And it's a called an experience good. So a movie or a book are experience goods. Data, you only get value by the way you use it. It doesn't actually have any data of it, any value in its own. Whether you invest your time, money, attention in it always carries it a degree of uncertainty. We've been talking about the Internet of Things and the explosion of data, and these are some interesting statistics. By 2020, there will be seven times the number of connected devices as there are people on this planet, all talking to one another. I think it was um, John at First Central was talking about data storage, and the, actually the capabilities and the cost of us storing data have shrunk significantly. To store one terabyte now, 50 years later is, one is $27 compared to $3.5 billion. And we, seem to produ and we are producing more data than we have ever done in the past. We are now going to produce 44 times more data in 2020 than we did in 20 2009. So the huge data explosion requires a smarter approach, otherwise we will drown in this data. And I, I think when I look back, some financial companies and I talk about financial companies because they're, they're closest to us, they really don't get how much data, they, what they're sitting on, and the gold mine that they're actually sitting on. If they ignore it, then that gold mine of data will just turn into trash. Financial institutions do gather, but they don't necessarily save valuable in demographic data about their clients and their activities. They're probably just throwing away those pearls of wisdom. Greater connectivity, though, leads to increased vulnerability. By connecting devices, that makes them accessible. We've heard about sort of cyber security, and it's very important for the island that it manages its cyber security. Uh, and those conversations, I can tell you now, have been had many a time up in the Isle of Man too. Digital security, trust that supports it, is ever more critical. And this applies equally across both consumer and industrial applications whether or not you're wearing your health and fitness monitors, whether or not you're wearing your tag team monitor, or whether or not actually you've got a, a drill head monitor on an oil rig and it's measuring everything about the geology and the distance and the, um, and the, 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 the commodity that's coming out of the ground. Industry 4.0, 4 the fourth industrial revolution is something that we've spoken about before. And at the core of the industrial revolution is this hyper-connected world where the world is going to bristle with connected sensors. In fact, actually, you could not even leave a digital footprint as a person, but actually the amount of data that you generate by moving through digital sensors could actually be significant. So how do we work with, um, how do businesses work with data that is derived from this, industri from this industrial revolution? Well, all activities in the end will produce information but they don't necessarily produce digital data unless we put them towards a, a device, a sensor, or an application. Companies have been able to foresee this and pursue it. The, inform the information rising from activities, places, and things, like evaporating steam, have really profited from it. So data in this century has been written about before, The Economist wrote about it, in fact actually it was, it was your Economist article that you put up there and was the front page. They wrote about it, that data in this century is what oil was to the last century. It's a driver of growth and a driver of change. Flows of data create new infrastructure, new business, new monopolies, no doubt new politics as well, and crucially new econ economic, economics. Digital, digital information is unlike any other previous resource we've seen in the world. 
So what is great is the fact that it is extracted, it is refined. And there are new approaches that need, uh, needs to be uh, laid out, out from regulators, and we've been just hearing that about GDPR and how it's going to be managed. Data actually makes more data. So you can't see it, it says data makes more, but it does make more data. We've heard about algorithms, about um, ad targeting, inventory management, uh, fraud detection. They all produce more data from data that's pushed through those algorithms. Companies that actually capture that, that, that process, where they actually create and, and have an inflection point on their data, are going to actually be the successful ones in the next, in the next um, industry, 4.0. So this new industry paradigm, platforms are also areas that are going to win. Data network effects are important for the growth of digital services. So consider the collapse of the social network MySpace after Facebook's rapid rise. Consumers holding credit cards going to merchants. Merchants actually reciprocate wanting to attract people with certain cards and people with certain cards want to shop in merchants. It becomes a symbiotic relationship. So platforms, if you define a platform in the way that you're going to work with data, in the end you will win. In the past, and we, I think it was talking at the, in the last session, we were talking about sort of uh, a lady asked a question about AI and how businesses can actually, SMEs can, can, can build off of AI when they potentially haven't got the capital to be able to do it. Well, computing hardware is what we used to think of as a capital asset. But now it's actually the data is the asset, not the hardware. And we should be therefore providing the hardware and allowing people access to it with their data. And I'll come on to one of the, re one of the, um, one of the thoughts about how an island economy may be able to then use that as a, as, a, as a new industry type. So it's more about analyzing rapid real-time flows of unstructured data than it is about actually just dealing with um, the data itself. I won't necessarily go through this too much. I've had the same trouble as you've had with the SIPOs, but there we go. Um, I, think, I think these four areas absolutely play out to an offshore financial center. They are, they are the mainstay of everything that we do within the regulated financial services space. Who on this island in fiduciary services doesn't build a trusted relationship with their clients? Who doesn't deal with kind of control and fiduciary oversight of the assets that are placed in their keeping? We enhance the value of those assets. And all we're saying now is, tr is translate those financial assets to data assets. And again, we will enhance the values of them. And there is a level of transparency already within the system. And I know we're, we're asked to improve our transparency with UBO registries and with, with all the other regulatory re um, reporting that offshore financial centers have to do. But we're used to this. This is, it. This is our bread and butter of what we do on the islands. And it is no more whether you're handling financial data or whether or not you're handling uh, sort of bits and bytes. I did come across some interesting aspects around kind of GDPR, and I didn't want to talk too much about it, but actually it's around the sharing of data. And in Switzerland, for instance, there's a project called My Data where that collects health data from patients who then can decide whether or not they want to include that health data in research projects. Germany has got some mandatory data sharing rules as well. And I think uh, we were talking a little, I, I was thinking about data portability when we were talking about the, 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 the um, first central and the cars and the data that it's got for its, uh, for, that it collects in terms of its customers when it's putting through quotes for data uh, for insurance. Data portability is a real uh, cornerstone of the GDPR regulation when it comes in in May next year. Interestingly, some data expert experts are arguing that it's not only the collection of data that should be regulated, but its use. Food makers are barred from using certain ingredients in, in, in products. So why are online firms not necessarily prohibited from using certain data? 
or using it in such a way that could cause harm to an individual. This kind of shifts the responsibility of data away from data, towards data collectors and data users who are going to be held to account. So should we be, should we be deploying a use-based regulation in the way that we look after data? What I wanted to do quickly is just kind of give you a few ideas of how a data center may establish itself within this new market, within this new marketplace, and how it may deal with um, the new asset class and then earn, earn from it. Global value chain inhibitors. There, we've been talking about the transfer of data as, as having friction and it not necessarily being frictionless. But if, you can, if we can establish a marketplace where um, the transfer of data, even within one business, is smoother, is more frictionless, is actually treated um, uh, uh, more quickly, then actually what we could be doing is we could be adding to the total value of the global value chain. So an example of this would be where a marketing organization buys, produces, sells, licenses, and exports um, services as integrated components. Data flow follows through these processes. Often they're, they're transferred across borders and between countries. Uh, there was a, um, a survey by the United States International Trade Commission uh, which talked about digital trade for the US, and it absolutely said that there should be um, a, a reduction in the perceived barriers to digital trade uh, to, and to take them away would actually stimulate the economy and stimulate an increase in activity if, if an offshore centre such as Guernsey and the Isle of Man can find ways of actually making this happen then actually we, we can stimulate more of that data activity through our own shores Data refineries and data markets. Um, using the analogy of data as oil uh, and it coming out as a raw material, it needs refining. And so why cannot a data refinery not sit here on the Isle of Man? John, you mentioned about it being sort of high value and, and low footprint. That's exactly uh, what, we can, what we can do on, on Guernsey. By not having, you know, a data center doesn't take up much space uh, to, in truth. Uh, but it can hold a significant amount of data. Um, I'm interested to, just to recall um, the Isle of Man obviously has a significant e-gaming uh, sector uh, and there's one operator there that's been playing poker since 2002 and there's a data centre on the Isle of Man that holds every single hand ever dealt and ever played since 2002 and there are 100 million registered players in the world that play on this one poker site. Uh, now they hold that for reasons for counter, countering fraud, uh, and they go back and they search through all that data to make sure that nobody is colluding, nobody is playing bad hands, nobody is, 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 is misbehaving on the site. But they store all that data and they review it every time they, they look at an, a previous hand play. So you don't need a large footprint to hold that amount of data. The data markets is an interesting one. The data markets is, is actually the trading of data and actually selling it between, uh, between entities. And, and Emma may start to go a little bit cold when we hear that we're going to sell data, but with consent and with, uh, with proper upfront structuring, there is no reason why you couldn't um, sell it between, between parties. But interestingly, right now, there is very little, I think, in the way of actual data being sold uh, in its core sense. I think one of the, a couple of, uh, again, in the, uh, apologies, but in the e-gaming space, a couple of, um, of examples would be Caesars Entertainment um, uh, was valued, I think, at $17 billion. But that was not for the bricks and mortar of the, of the casinos in, in Nevada. That was for the player data, for all their registered customers. PokerStars was purchased by Amaya for $4 billion. Um, again, uh, apart from a little bit of technology around the game, to all intents and purposes, it was a play on content. And it has always remained a play on content. It just gives you access to 100 million people to actually go and push out everything else apart from poker. So it is, it, data can be bought and sold, but at the moment it's being bought and sold within companies, not 
as, as an asset in its own right. And then the last one would be the data embassy concept. And I don't know how many people, we've, we heard earlier on about Estonia, so I don't know how many people are aware, obviously, that Luxembourg has created um, uh, an embassy for Estonia in its tier four, one of its tier four data centers. And it did that um, uh, very nimbly, very quickly. Uh, in 2014, it said, they, it said that's what they wanted to do. Uh, and they did it off the back of it being one of the safest countries in the world. It's one of the United Nations founding members. Uh, it acts as a host for NATO's digital backup too. And so the government put all of their, 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 their thought and their strength into making Luxembourg a place for big data, for big data to sit in, in data centers. They chose that as their one play on data. But they put everything to it. Uh, and as a result of that, they found themselves you know, this year, turning around and saying they were going to hold all of a copy, a copy of everything that Estonia has in its digital economy. So hopefully, I've got us a little bit back on. I haven't got us back on track, but never mind. Um, so there are certainly ways that that we can think about global data centres actually establishing new trades. These are um, these are all areas that I can tell you the Isle of Man is thinking about. Uh, we've had all the same discussions and everything I've heard today actually in some ways should be pleasing, in some ways maybe, maybe not, but everything I've heard is exactly the same as I've been hearing and we've been talking about in the Isle of Man. Uh, we're having exactly the same discussions. Um, I'm going to leave you with a quote too, not from Henry Ford, a little bit more of a, um, uh, of a, of a modern pioneer. But more and more important assets in the economy are composed of bits and not atoms. And that was from Eric Brynjolfsson. Uh, who I don't know if anyone wants to read his his book with um, Andrew McAfee, the race of the Machi race against the machines, uh, and the second uh, second uh, information age. There are some excellent books actually, which to look at public policy as well in the space of a uh, of, um, of of government policy on on economies that are getting more digital. Well, I'd like to leave you with that thought. Thank you very much.